In late November of 1944, an incident occurred in Belgium that left investigators baffled when an unannounced American B-17 bomber landed on an RAF airfield just outside of the Belgian village of Huldenberg. In this video we are going to explore the strange happenings on that fateful day and see if we can shed light on the shocking story of the Phantom Fortress of World War II. On November 21st, 1944, as World War II was entering its final stages, a strange event occurred that to this day remains unexplained. On what was an ordinary day at an RAF base in Krothenburg, Belgium, artillery teams were stunned to see the giant spectre of a B-17G roaring into view from seemingly out of nowhere. Although it was an Allied base, the men at the RAF were not used to seeing American warplanes show up unannounced. No attempt at communication had been made by the crew of the unidentified B-17 as it descended toward the runaway at speed. The landing gears were down and all four engines were running loudly. From the way it was flying it was assumed that the aircraft had been damaged in combat and was attempting to make an emergency landing. As the flying fortress approached, Emergency teams remained on standby in anticipation of a bad crash. However, it was also a concern that it may even be a German trick, like a Trojan horse, so the entire base was placed on high alert as a precaution. The 35,000 pound aircraft came down hard, just barely clearing the anti-aircraft batteries that guarded the airfield. The heavy impact caused it to bounce and tilt over to one side which sent the wing plowing into the soil. The propeller of the outside engine made contact with the ground and exploded into dangerous shards of flying metal. The soldiers at the base hit the deck as the B-17 fishtailed and righted itself before cruising down the runway and slowly coming to a complete stop. Stunned and slightly angry at the pilot for putting everyone at risk, the ground teams moved in but kept their distance as the engines were still running. They waited patiently for the pilot to power down the engines and for the crew to exit the aeroplane. But after 15 minutes, the engines were still running and none of the crew had even exited the plane. Suspicion started to grow and believing that the aircraft might be incapacitated, the decision was made to board the aircraft. But being an RAF base, the soldiers were unfamiliar with how to gain access to the American warplane. A British Army officer by the name of Major John Crisp approached the flying fortress with the intent to border. Being a soldier and not an airman, it took him a few minutes to locate the entry hatch just below the fuselage. Considering the possibility that it was a German trap and apprehensive that at best he was finding the bodies of the deceased bomber crew, Major Crisp was hesitant and cautious as he entered the aircraft alone. At first he noticed flight jackets passed onto the floor alongside half-eaten bars of chocolate as if they had been discarded in a hurry. He was stunned when he found that there were actually 12 parachutes neatly stored on the rack and ready for use. Confused, Major Crisp continued on into the cramped aircraft, eventually making it all the way to the cockpit. Once again he found it empty with no sign of the pilot or the co-pilot. Confused even more by this turn of events, Major Crisp proceeded to power down the engines and make safe the B-17. Where were the ten men of the air crew? How did they abandon the aircraft without using any of the parachutes? Why did they leave the flight jackets behind? How did the aircraft land itself? Major Crisp turned to the flight logs for answers. The only thing of interest that he found was the navigator's log which simply read, Bad Flack. Perplexed by these discoveries, Major Crisp reported back to his superiors and they were so disturbed by the report that he immediately dispatched a team of specialists to investigate. 
When the investigators arrived, they set about inspecting the bomber. At first they noticed that the B-17G had no name painted onto its fuselage. Since it was customary for a flying fortress to be named, it indicated to the investigators that the aircraft must have been brand new. Once they attained the serial number, commanders in the 8th Air Force were able to recognize the B-17 as belonging to the 91st Bomber Group that operated out of East Anglia in England. Lieutenant Harold LeBolt was identified as the pilot of the fortress. He and his crew had flown out of East Anglia on a daytime bombing mission to destroy Nazi oil refineries in Meersburg, Germany. British bombing crews usually flew bombing missions at night time under the cover of darkness, but American bomber crews insisted on flying daytime missions as the visibility was much better and allowed for more accurate strikes. But this put American warplanes at much greater risk of being destroyed by flak, which would explain the navigator's log entry. A search operation was immediately launched to find the missing crew. The brass were very eager to solve the mystery quickly because rumours of a ghost plane were already circling amongst the soldiers. The crew were eventually located at an airbase in Belgium, having been picked up by a patrol of British infantrymen. Lieutenant De Bolt was debriefed, but his explanation left more questions than answers. According to his report, it was dark and rainy with thick cloud cover on the day they flew toward their target in Merseburg, Germany. But the flight went well right up until the bombing run. In the slow turn to target with the bomb bay doors open, Lieutenant De Bolt's B-17 stalled and fell out of formation. To make matters worse for the Lieutenant, a pack of Luftwaffe Messerschmitt BF-109s instantly descended upon them and sprayed the floundering bomber with gunfire. The situation became more dire as flak began exploding around them from anti-aircraft batteries below. The guns were accurate and the flak was heavy. As the bombardier looked through the Sperry bomb site and lined up the target ready to drop the payload, the drop mechanism malfunctioned and the bomb was not released. This caused the plane to fall farther behind the rest of the formation and they continued to lose altitude. At that moment the whole bomber shook as a burst of flak exploded just below the bomb bay doors and the fortress was badly damaged. Fortunately this caused the bombs to drop but it also shut down engines number two and three. Number two was out completely, but number three was still spinning and caused bad vibrations to shake throughout the aircraft. The crew began to jettison all non-essential equipment in an attempt to lighten the airplane, while Lieutenant De Bolt set course for home. The B-17 was still losing altitude and was turned to a heading of 270 degrees west toward friendly territory. The crew remained with the plane until it fell to 2,000 feet, and Lieutenant DeBolt finally gave the order to bail out. DeBolt placed the fortress on autopilot before he jumped. He was the last man to leave the aircraft. All of their chutes opened successfully, and DeBolt, alongside his crew, watched the B-17 glide into the distance as they drifted down toward the earth. Unknown to DeBolt, the damaged bomber continued along its course, gradually losing altitude as it did so. Incredibly, it somehow stayed airborne and flew straight to the RAF airfield in Belgium, coming down on a perfect glide slope and making a perfect three-point landing. In light of the Bolt's testimony, several glaring questions remained unanswered. How did the landing gears deploy? How did the two damaged engines recover? How did the plane fly a perfect course to the airfield and make a successful landing? But most of all, how did the crew bail out? when all the parachutes were still on board. Why didn't they bring their flight jackets? As for the engines recovering, it is possible that the engines on a B-17 could have restarted if the weight of the aircraft was significantly decreased. After the crew bailed out, the plane may have been light enough for the engines to recover. This may have extended the range of the bomber's glide path, coincidentally by just enough to bring her right to the RAF base, and also coincidentally, at the exact decline of altitude that would have been needed to make a three-point landing. There are no explanations as to how the landing gears deployed themselves. How the B-17 flew a perfect course at the airfield is also difficult to explain. The autopilot of the age was primitive compared to modern systems, 
and it was completely incapable of landing the aircraft. The course set was merely a heading, not a GPS location. But what about the parachutes and the flight jackets? How were all the parachutes still on board the airplane after the crew bailed out? Some have said that since Major John Cruz was a soldier and not an airman, that he may have mistaken the packs where the parachutes were stored as being actual parachutes, and thus believed that none of the parachutes were missing. But if this were true, why didn't the investigation team catch this and correct the record, which they didn't? Was this event just a simple serendipitous series of happy accidents, or was there something more to this story? Did some unknown force land the aircraft, or was the entire thing just a bizarre coincidence? When the B-17 was examined on the field, the damage that Lieutenant DeBolt described as coming from the flak was not evident. The only damage on the aircraft was from the landing when the propeller struck the ground. Other than that, the fortress was in perfect working order. So what really happened? There are several oddities involved in this incident that don't really make sense. It's not a simple case of dismissing one or two of them. There are a series of interconnected strange happenings that had to occur in perfect sequence in order to create this mystery. The bolt neither lowered the gear nor the flaps for landing. So who or what did? Not to mention that the plane went on to make a perfect three-point landing meaning that the rear wheels hit the ground first, and then the nose. In order to achieve this, the nose of the aircraft would have to have been raised, a result common with the flaps being down. What really happened on that fateful day in November of 1944? Was it just a fluke, a once-off, or something more incredible, something paranormal? At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide which option is most believable. Did a B-17 land itself at an airbase in Belgium after being abandoned by the crew? Or did something else happen? Something so unusual that it was brushed under the carpet by a leadership that just didn't want to delve into it. In the end, this tale of the phantom plane will remain unanswered. Just another foil in a stack of shocking stories that hint at a reality that isn't quite what it seems to be. A tantalizing taste of possibility that may in fact be just a peek behind the curtain that if ever fully understood, would change the course of our existence forever.